Today, I just want to show you all a bit of, uh, well, what we've seen happening in the past decade. As Fashion United started, well, about 12 years ago, we've seen many, many companies, many IDs uh, come across in, in the offices. And about 10 years ago, it was still, you know, I told you so, uh, selling clothes online is never going to happen. That was the statement back then. Um, maybe in a far future away, it would be a 5% market share. That is what fashion online would be. I mean, people will always, you know, go to stores. Um, they always want to smell the, the, the material, the clothing they're about to buy. And this was the opinion of executives in the, in the industry about 10 years ago. I mean, back then, we just had the internet bubble. We had great examples from Boo.com, blowing away millions and millions of uh, euros, dollars, and, uh, well, Statement then, it was just not going to happen. There wasn't a question about that. So, they almost had me convinced. So that's the reason why, you know, Fashion United started, or actually kept on going after the internet bubble as a, well, say, a B2B trade publication, a portal, what we were back then. I mean, looking back, maybe I would have hoped that we started a, a, an online uh, web shop back then, selling clothes. For sure, we've, we would have made a lot more money. And, uh, well, I'll take you into the facts that we see today, because a lot of things changed in the last couple of years. People are online everywhere and anywhere at any time. Well, you see here the, the old first great Steve Jobs success, the Apple computer. And then, well, this is today on the right side. And people are internet savvy. Even our youngest daughter, five years old, can install an application, Android that is, I must say, and download her uh, favorite Hello Kitty. But what actually changed in the fashion industry from a customer perspective? Virtually nothing, or actually a lot changed, virtually, but actually nothing changed. Is the only difference that there's a 6% market share for online, online sales. Because when I, as a consumer, walk into a, well, say, a quite successful store from the past decade, that would be a Zara, in 2002, it looked exactly the same as in 2012. So from a consumer perspective, there's not any difference at all. The shop windows are still the same. And Okay, maybe things changed. We do a bit of EDI, ERP systems are connected here and there. Uh, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't send faxes. Maybe you can take the lens off. <laughs> okay, it's technology. Anyhow, um, that is what, uh, what the difference is. But now, you know, we're living the WWW, the World Wide West. Say, well, centuries ago, we had the farmers who dominated the industry, and that took, well, many centuries, actually. So they were dominating economy. Then 150 years ago, we had, we had the industrialists. They dominated, well, our world for at least 100 years, 150 years. And now the information economists are there, and they are just getting started. Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Apple, they're all information economists, and they are already, I mean, they have a huge influence already in the world, but where are they going? I mean, the, in the Industrial Revolution took, um, well, say, 100 years. How long will this continue? And we're just getting started. So it's the World Wide West, a fight for market share. Think about Facebook. Next week, having its IPO at a valuation of, oh, 100 billion, that is. It's an amazing number, the biggest IPO ever in tech world. So there's a lot going on. It's the World Wide West. People are fighting. And then imagine that only 10 years ago, people said that consumers would never buy clothes online or shoes. It was just not going to happen. Imagine that. And this is today. 
or actually 2012, maybe it's next year. But now, companies which did not exist 10 years ago or were just getting started, like ASOS, UX, they were there, all right, but they were, well, virtually nothing. And today, or at the end of the year, they will have a bigger turnover than the whole Dutch fashion market altogether. Just 20 companies. So that's quite an amazing, amazing number when you really think about that. I mean, the Dutch market is about 10 billion. I think the German market is, about, uh, is at about 26 billion euro turnover. And they're about to do that. And yes, okay, they are active in many countries and, well, say global, some of them. But nevertheless, altogether, it does have a huge impact on the regular brick and mortar business model. So compare that to 10 years ago. What do you mean it's not going to happen? This is a huge turnover. Take Zalando, of course, Germany's pride. They have a 300% growth annually for the past three years. They will, they will pass the 1 billion turnover mark uh, this year. So that's a, a really impressive number. And then come to think that it, this is just the beginning of e-commerce. And the great thing is, you know, there's, there's more demand, and because of the, this rise, there's more supply, and because of this supply, there's more people going to buy clothing online, which makes rise de well, no, sorry, which makes demand rise even more. So it's a virtuous circle. It's just growing stronger, stronger, and stronger. Impressive. So from the 6% online sales we have now, people say that we might go to a 40% online sales in 2020. Who would have imagined that? I mean, 40%? That would mean that the traditional brick-and-mortar retail outlet would not exist anymore, or at least for 60%. But a lot of people really feel the pain already. But 40% is something that you cannot, well, survive if you do not focus on your own niche. And what about your market share? What if you're just a standalone retailer somewhere in a village and, well, you have to cope with these kind of percentages? Then you really have to make sure that you're building a relationship with the customer in your local area. So 40%. I mean, I have to see it, but this is the predictions of some very smart people working at banks and all sorts of institutions. But why would this happen? Because pioneers came, like in the World Wide West, they have a strategy and they want to win. They fight for market share, like in the, world, in the Wild West, people came out and they, well, they went westwards and they, they fought for, for land. And that's what hap what, what's happening now. If you, if you manage to get your piece of the market at this moment in time, and if you can get maybe a half percent, a one percent, or even one-tenth of a percentage, and get your own niche going, you will have a huge, a huge turnover in maybe, well, let's say, 20 years' time. And these professionals, you know, they're getting more professional every year. You cannot compare this with the, say, the farmer's revolution or the industri industrial revolution. Because back then, people did not have the information we have now. I mean, you know now more every day than you did back then in a whole year. And that's a big difference, and that is why competition is more fierce than ever. And these people, they live by these rules, and I have a short video for that, and they only want to win. This is the world we're in the World Wide West, with sound, that is. Winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all-the-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. <laughs> Every time a football player goes to ply his trade, he's got to play from the ground up, from the soles of his feet right up to his head. Every inch of him has to play. 
Some men play with their heads. You've got to be smart to be number one in any business. But more importantly, you've got to play with your heart, with every fiber of your body. If you're lucky enough to find a man with a lot of head and a lot of heart, he's never going to come off the field second. I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. I love that video. I mean, this is the rules people live by now. And this is what Solando lives by, uh, Vente Privé, and they're just getting started. It's about building brands, it's about building the relationship in this niche market with your consumer, and they are big winning brands, and, and the retail experience, and this is both on and offline. But these are the rules. I mean, people are, are smarter and smarter each day. They have all the information available, and they are looking, you know, along, along your shoulder. And, well, next, uh, another nice thing is don't try to be original, just try to be good every day. I mean, winning is a habit, and you don't do that. You know, it's, it's not a sometime thing, it's an all the time thing. That's how you can conquer your niche and be the biggest. Um, another thing for today was um, mass customization which we will see some presentations. Uh, what we've seen in the past is that fashion is like television. 80% of the consumers, they just want to sit on the sofa and see you know, what the broadcasters are sending them. Just sit down as a couch potato. In fashion, it's at least 80%. People do not want to think what color they would put where on a certain garment. They just want clothing and they want it fast, they want it easy and they want value for money. So if you're talking niche-wise, maybe there is a 20-15% uh, market share there where you can accelerate and, and conquer the market. Because what we see happening, and we made a, a fashion item top 100, well, sorry for the small font, but this is uh, something you can see online. This is a list of the, well, the biggest fashion companies in the world which we have um, uh, updated, uh, well, real-time, actually. And these are the biggest stock-listed companies. And you see that they are more and more getting a market share of maybe 80%. Just to give you a, an ID, uh, the top 10 of this list do about 170 billion annual turnover in dollars, that is. So 170 billion is what the, only the top 10 does. So these are the biggest stock-listed companies, and we're building a benchmark around that. So you can check what are these companies doing, what's their, uh, their turnover, their growth. And we actually made another list, and that's the Fashion United Facebook Index. That brings me to the social, um, the social media activities in fashion. Crazy thing is, we don't actually really know what social media impact is in fashion. And the, 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 the craziest thing is that, for instance, the Twitter activity or the, the hits you get from Twitter, you can't even really measure correctly. Now, this is the, the Facebook index. So these are the biggest brands or the most socially popular brands in, in the world at the moment, um, Converse. How can they be so big? I mean, they have almost 30 million likes or fans that we used to call them. Victoria's Secret, I assure you, that are not only women being uh, the fans or the likers there, and Adidas, Sarah, the Burby, but these are the most popular brands on Facebook, so they have the most likes. I would like to tell you how they got these likes why they became so popular, but I don't really have the time. And to be honest, we don't actually really know. They invest a lot of money, but what's the effect? 
Okay, so they're on this slide now, but how and why did you get there? That's something you really have to wonder. What's the, what's the point of getting there? Which brings me to the Twitter index. You cannot even measure how you, you became that big or how, how many hits, sorry, you, you get from, uh, from Twitter. You can only see, okay, wow, it's great. I mean, your, your, your hits are going up, your visits are going up. Fashion United now is at about, I think, 100,000 100, uh, followers. But still, in our statistics, we cannot really track who comes from Twitter. So that's quite amazing. Um, we made a, a joint social uh, index. So that's a combined, combined index from Facebook, Twitter. Who are the most popular brands there? That's Burberry on, on uh, the first spot, uh, H&M and Victoria's Secret. So in the combined social index, these are the most popular brands. Burberry saw a rise of, well, it almost doubled in the past year. H&M, 148% growth. Amazing, Victoria's Secret, 136% growth. That is on Facebook. So they're growing fast. Burberry, yes, you know, they really tripled their, their online spendings and their social media spendings. And yes, uh, their turnover has re hit record heights. That for sure. But even they cannot really specify that, that, that this huge uh, sales came from Burberry. Uh, that was a, a Apple glitch. This is a Burby growth on Twitter, 300%, H&M, 464%, Victoria's Secret, 681%. And it is so incredibly difficult to get your, your, your uh, numbers up with followers, with likes. How do you get that? But on the other hand, really think about the results. What's in it for you? This brings me to uh, Threadless, and um, yeah, Philippe from Spreadshirt will um, tell you, maybe tell you a lot, a lot more about them later on. Or I'll, I'll ask him some questions because this is actually the only social fashion company we found really making a lot of money, and, and uh, where you can really prove this is because of social media. So it's crowd sourcing, crowd, crowd designing. Their designs are created by and chosen by an online community. So you upload a print, you upload a design, and people can, uh, people can vote for your design, and then it will be submitted to the store. So last April, over 250 submissions per day they had. So, well, that's a huge number of designs coming in. And they had 1.18 million votes by 22,000 people. So it's, these numbers are huge, and this results well, in, a, in a quite a nice turnover and a cooperation with Gap now, for instance. So Gap will be selling their clothing. Threadless founded in 2000 with only $1,000 and now they have in revenue about an estimated $40 million. And they have a top position in the Fashion United uh, Twitter index with 1.8 million followers. So that's a lot of people connected with you every day. But that is, as I said, the only really social fashion company, but I'd really like to hear uh, the Spreadshirt story later on because they see this, well, it's sort of the same market, but they see uh, a lot of difference between the two. Well, my time is up. Another very uh, exciting thing is uh, the cotton, the raw materials, and the wool price in the fashion industry, which is uh, quite shocking at the moment. This is only the past, I think, two years. Cotton price doubled. Cotton price went down. Uh, only really big companies can handle that. And if you, if you would have started, say, 50 years ago, even then, you did not see a peak like this. So every industry with a raw materials rise or peak like this one is in some serious challenges at least, which will uh, definitely, um, well, only, only the really big companies big professionals are up with these challenges. So there too, the World Wide West is really you know, kicking ass and you really, have a, you really need a, a thick skull, no brains and a need to be bashed mentality, I think, to get out there and get your, uh, your market share and fight for it and go for it all the time. So I'm really curious to hear uh, these presentations later on in the day. And um, basically, the conclusion or the, the things we ask ourselves in the Fashion Night at the 
offices is what's your niche? So which company will we see coming up? Which new revolutions will we see? Who will be fighting in the World Wide West in the fashion industry? And the great thing is, be yourself, because everyone else is already taken. I like that quote. So what is your niche market and what will you do? That was it, Anitra. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonard. No, thanks.